This morning we're going to be in Romans chapter 8. We've been in Romans for the last few weeks in this uh, pseudo-series that I've been preaching. We'll be in Romans chapter 8. Uh, if you need a Bible, there's just one in the pew rack in front of you. Um, a lot of my kids have grown up. Well, maybe. <laughs> Define growing up, <laughs> um, but um, they're all adults, let's put it that way, legal adults at this point. One's still in the house, um, but uh, all the other ones, one's, one's still moving today. Please be praying for Josh as they're still in that process this weekend, moving from Jersey City to White Plains. And uh, of course, the other one is married, and then there's one Lee who is still in the house with us going to college, but... They're all adults at this point, but when they were growing up, they, we, we, we did a lot of things together as a family. We, uh, you know, we went places, did fun things as much as we could. We played games in the house. We watched some movies together. You know, when I grew up, there was Disney and some of the other ones. Of course, Disney isn't what Disney used to be, so we kind of avoided some of that. But, um, but we got blessed with the movie company Pixar that came along. And Pixar was awesome. I mean, you know, if you don't know Pixar, Pixar's Toy Story 1, Toy Story 2, Toy Story 3, and a lot of other movies. But those are the ones it's mostly na- known for, cars and things like that. Uh, one of the ones that uh, came out by Pixar was Finding Nemo. Now, Finding Nemo was a movie about a clownfish named Marlin, who had a son named Nemo, who he was extremely protective of. In fact, he felt like Nemo was not ready to venture out too far from the reef because if he did, he'd be in this vast ocean all by himself and would have no clue how to get back home, would get lost, and would be forever gone. Well, sure enough, as can happen with us parents sometimes, our worst fears could come to be true. And Nemo does, in fact, get lost. He gets out beyond where he should be, and before he knows it, he's gone, ultimately ends up in Australia, away from his dad entirely. And the story is about trying to find Nemo, Marlin's search for his son, and how desperate he is to find Nemo. And all of his adventures along the way, as well as Nemo's adventures, they kind of bounce back and forth, what's going on with Nemo, how's Marlin going, doing trying to find him? And, and all these adventures that Marlin has trying to find Nemo. Along the way, Marlon makes a friend named Dory. Dory's a unique individual, a unique fish. She's a blue tang fish who doesn't have a very good memory. How many of you can say amen to that? Okay, and I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I mean, her memory is so bad that you can tell her something and just a few moments later... You have to tell it to her again. Or she could tell you something, and just a few moments later, she's telling it to you again, not even remembering that she told you. And so this is the help Marlon has trying to find Nemo. Someone that he has to constantly remind them what they're even trying to accomplish. But, as you can imagine, there were highs and lows in this. Marlon gets very, very discouraged. He's not only afraid that he's never going to find Nemo again, he feels like, he he feels discouraged, he feels defeated, he he starts feeling depressed, and he's ready to give up. And Dory, who knows absolutely nothing about what's going on at all, (laughs) gives him an amazing piece of advice. Just keep swimming. And she keeps saying over again, just keep swimming, just keep swimming, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. You know why that's such amazing advice? Because when we're really going through discouragement and difficulty, trials and tribulations, we can't change what has happened, and we can't control what will happen, but we can live in the moment. And sometimes all we can do is just keep swimming and pray that we'll find our Nemo (laughs) or whatever it is that we're looking for in life. Over the last few weeks, we have been looking at Romans 7 and 8. 
And on a different level of just difficulty, sometimes the difficulties in our life are a result of some of our choices. And we've come to realize that even Paul the Apostle had great difficulty living the Christian life without sin. He still committed sin. He still struggled with the issue of the flesh versus what the Holy Spirit inside was telling him should be the life that he lives. He recognized it as a spiritual war, a war with our own flesh. And in that war that we go through, we can grow weary. We can even grow doubtful and even feel like giving up. Lord, I'm never going to beat this sin, so I'm just going to accept it's a part of my life and just kind of keep on living in it, just being that. and I'll, I'll never get past it, but I know I'm going to heaven, and that's okay. And that is okay. We know we're going to heaven. Praise God, we know that if we're in Christ. But that's not the goal. The goal is not to just say, okay, I'll, I'll just be whatever. The goal is to be more like Jesus. It's, it's real easy to give up because we even talked about this some in Sunday school today, and we even came to the, if you got to it, I don't know if you got to it, but at the very end, this passage is mentioned in the Sunday school lesson, the very one we're looking at today. We, we, we have to fight sin, but it's hard because of the central pleasure it brings. Or the emotional pleasure it brings. Or the mental relief it can bring. I mean, it can bring pleasure, as I've said many times, to choose somebody out when we're mad at them. Is that the right thing to do? No, it makes us feel better, but it's not the right thing to do. A couple weeks ago, I spoke about a diet, being on a diet. Um, when you diet, you oftentimes reach a plateau somewhere along the way. That's when you have a choice. I can give up and say, oh, this diet's not working for me. Or you can keep pushing on it. Keep pushing on it to see if you get off that plateau and keep making progress. And that's the choice we have. When we're feeling defeated, when we're feeling discouraged by sin or by life, sometimes we got to stop and go, all right, Lord, I know where I'm at. I know where you want me to be. I'm having trouble getting there. I just got to keep swimming. I got to keep swimming in the right direction. Not choose to start swimming backwards. And going the other way. And go back to where I once was. So as we continue to look at Romans 7 and 8. We get to chapter 8 today. Verses 18 through 39. That's where we're going to be. And we find Paul offering encouragement to the believer that is meant to keep us hopeful, to keep us strong, to help us persevere and not give up. Now, I'm not going to read the whole thing in one shot because it's a long passage. I'm going to read it point by point. His first piece of encouragement is to remind us that the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. Look, starting at verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. The best is yet to come. Verse 18, I consider it the sufferings of this present time right now are going to be totally overwhelmed by what I'm going to see someday when I stand before the Lord. That the sorrow and ugliness that we see in this world, our flags are at half-mast today because somebody decided to shoot a bunch of cops in Charlotte. The ugliness of this world will be gone, forgotten, because of the great and magnificent beauty of the Lord himself and what we will one day see. It's far outweighed by it. But in the meantime, we live in this creation Paul's talking about 
that is also affected by the fall and sinfulness of mankind. You see, when Adam and Eve fell, there was a curse issued by God upon the world, and the world changed as a whole. This earth groans, earthquakes, we talked about Wednesday night, tornadoes, things like that. This world is groaning under the weight of sin. We are groaning under the weight of sin. Our bodies hurt because of the weight of sin in this world. Whether it be our choices or the choices of somebody else that affects us. And the aging process and the fact that death was introduced into the world by the first sin of mankind. And therefore, from the moment we start living, we also start dying. And the older we get, sometimes the more our bodies hurt and the more we feel that weight upon us. All of creation feels the anxiety this world produces and all of it longs for eternal peace in the presence of God and for restoration to be made new. Because of the fall, all of creation needs recreation. And we see that in verse 21. The creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. This is the final transformation of creation that we have already begun that process. We're already in that process, right? The earth is not. We are, by choice through the blood of Jesus Christ. We're in that transformation process, being brought into the glory of God, and the rest of the world will come along with it someday when he returns, and there's a new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem. Verse 22, for we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. Now, that's a vivid illustration. All we go through in this world is like the pain a woman goes through when in labor. But in the end... When that child is put in her arms, pain is forgotten because love, whoop, it's like pain is right here and love is back here and all of a sudden love just overwhelms that. It was all worth it. Verse 23, and not only this, but we also, but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit, in other words, being born again now in this present moment, even we ourselves groan within ourselves for a better day, waiting eagerly for our adoption sons, the redemption of our body which is yet to come. This verse has somewhat obvious meaning. The longer we live, the more we feel the strain of life on our bodies, the more we long for a day when our bodies have been made new. And that will be complete when our adoption as God's children is completed. Think about it. We are really still in the process. We are adopted if we're in Christ, but our Heavenly Father has not taken us home yet. It's official, but it's not a done deal. You know what I'm saying? Let me, let me illustrate this on a personal level. When we adopted one Lee, we signed papers in a government office in China. The moment we signed those papers, she was our daughter. She was ours. But she wasn't home. She was still in China. Just like this is no longer our home because we're now in Christ, but yet we're still here. For her, just like for us, that process, that transition home was very difficult. We got on that plane, and I don't know how she knew it at five and a half years of age, having nothing but an orphanage experience. They had told her, this is going to be your new family, you're going to a new home. She understood that enough that when she hit that plane, and she'd been on a plane with us already once, she knew this was the departure from China. And she cried. Like, I don't think I've ever heard a child cry. She mourned on that flight so loudly that people complained. Can you not get her under control? And I'm sitting there thinking, you don't understand. She's not crying because she's on a plane. She's crying because she just lost everything she's ever known. 
and has no idea what it's going to be like on the other side of this flight. She knows her father is going to be there, not excluding Natalie, but I'm using it for my illustration, just like we know our heavenly father is going to be there. But she was still in process. She was adopted, but she wasn't home, and she was in process, and that's exactly where we are. We've been adopted. We know we're going home. We know we have a heavenly father, but we're not there yet. And this world is hard. And it leads us to sometimes mourning and despair and discouragement and even feelings of wanting to give up. Because the process is hard. And instead of crying along our journey home, we can be encouraged. Verse 24, for in hope we have been saved. We can hold on to that. But hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. You see, our hope is in knowing that the best is yet to come. I'm sure no matter how much those wonderful ladies from the orphanage told her, you're going to have a better life there. Things are going to be better there. It was hard for her to understand that as a child, just like it's hard for us to be absolutely certain of it as God's children. But it will. It will. And we can eagerly anticipate it. As God's adopted children, this is not our home. We're in transition It's difficult because we so love where we are and have not seen where we'll one day be. It takes eyes of faith to get beyond the suffering and anxiety this world produces and the pain we feel in our bodies to see that the best is indeed yet to come. It takes faith to see with our hearts that being with Jesus will be far better than being with even our spouses and our children. It's hard for us to imagine, but it's true. The best is yet to come. So be encouraged, church. Just keep swimming. (laughs) But until then, it helps to know the second thing, that God is with us and for us. He is with us and for us. Verses 26 through 30. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. We do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groaning too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also <coughs> excuse me, glorified. I'm not going to get into all the deep theology and doctrine of this passage today. There's so many things you could preach out of this passage. I could be here all day if I did that. But the things I want us to see is this. Number one, the Spirit helps us even pray. If you're in Christ today, you have received the Holy Spirit. And if you're like me, sometimes it's hard to pray without being emotional. Sometimes I pray when I'm angry and it's hard for me to put the anger aside. And God has, his spirit has to kind of intervene for me. Sometimes I pray when I'm really, really sad and heartbroken for somebody else or even in my own life. And the spirit has to intercede. Sometimes I pray and I'm totally confused and blinded by my emotions so much. Like, God, I don't even know what to pray. I don't know what your will is in this situation. But the Holy Spirit always does. Because the Holy Spirit is God. And so he intervenes and helps. We can remember that God always has a purpose. God always knows his purpose and is the only one who can accomplish his purpose. Prayer, in part, is submission to God's will even when we don't know what it is. Even when we pray amiss, the Holy Spirit in us intercedes to pray God's will anyway. What we also see is not only is God with us in force, but God has good purposes for us. Verse 28, even when things seem to go bad, he says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. He works all things to work together for our good. No matter what you're going through, no matter how bad it might seem in the moment, 
Just keep swimming because God's got something good on the other side. Even if it is heaven, God's always got something good on the other side for his children. He has promised that to us. God takes care of his own. Verse 29, he, he, he foreknew us. He's known us. He's known us before we were even born. He knows every single person on planet earth better than they know themselves. And we're told that he predestined us to become conformed to the image of his son. He had a plan. He had a plan that he would give himself, essentially, to die for us, to bring forgiveness to us, to make us like him. Now, think about this, and I will get into a little theology for just a moment. He created us how, church? Come on. In his image. Sin did what to us? Messed up that image, marred that image. His goal through Christ is to restore us to his image. It's his purpose. It's his plan. It's what he's doing, and he's working on us. He set us aside for that special work, restoring us back to that, to create a family of people that are once again image bearers of God rather than image bearers of the world and its principles. Verse 30, he predestined, he called, he, he justified, and he also glorified. His whole purpose in creating was to have a world that would glorify him and reveal his glory to the world. People made in his image with a free will who would choose to love him like he loves us. See, when we fell, he loved us so much that he gave his son to justify us and one day glorify us in his eternal presence. The point is this. Despite our sin and rebellion, God is always working with us and for us to restore us. He doesn't give up on us. Satan did not get the final say in the Garden of Eden. He didn't. Christ got it when he walked out of the tomb. And we'll complete our salvation when he steps out on the clouds. See, we can walk as confident children of God because he never leaves us or forsake us. That doesn't mean he gives us every desire of our sinful hearts. It means he's always here to guide us, forgive us, and transform us. He is always at work. Philippians 1, 6 says, He who began a good work in you will perfect it, complete it, until the day of Christ Jesus. God is on your side and still making you new. That's a promise of God. We don't have to stay just like we are right now. Ever. Some of you have come out of some things. You're not what you once were. But don't settle for where you are right now either. Because he's still working on you. He's still working on you. So be encouraged, church. And just keep swimming. Finally, the best encouragement is receive what we all long for. What is that? Love. We all long for love. We all want to be loved unconditionally, eternally. It's why we were made to be loved and to love God. Therefore, it's important to know that God loves us. God loves us. Verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? This is not really a question. It's a statement that's brought about as a form of what's a rhetorical question uh no one there's no one that can come against us that god can't handle if god's for us and we just discovered that he is then there's nothing that anyone or anything can do to keep us from being in god verse 32 he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Jesus paid it all so God could bless us with himself. A relationship with himself. God cannot consistently do good toward us, as we saw back in verse 28, until Jesus is our Lord and Savior. Remember it said, God works all things together for good to those who love God. God. That statement, love God, indicates have submitted themselves to him, are surrendered to him, are in relationship with him. Okay? He will always do good for those who are in relationship with him through Jesus Christ. Now, verses 33 and 34. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? Who is the one who justifies? Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes 
for us. Now, the, again, these questions are rhetorical. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? Nobody can. That charge has been defeated by the cross through the justification of Jesus. Who is the one who condemns? Well, back in verse 1 when we looked at Romans 8, 1, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So the answer is no one. No one can bring a condemnation. Even God is not going to bring condemnation against us. He might bring us a little bit of discomfort in order to discipline us, but he will never bring condemnation upon those who are in Christ, ever. You see, the enemy cannot defeat us because Jesus has defeated him. We are God's elect. Those chosen by him and justified by him are sealed by his spirit and no longer under that condemnation. Instead, we are favored and have Jesus as our advocate who intercedes to the Father on our behalf even when we sin. Now 35 through 37. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. Just as written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. You see, the troubles of this world cannot defeat us, including death, because God loves us and has overcome the world through Jesus. The only way those things get us down is when we take our eyes off of him. When we take our eyes off of Jesus, those things can get us down. They can't take our salvation from us, but they can get us down. All the trials and tribulations and struggles of this world, even our own sin issues, can get us down when we aren't looking to Jesus. So if you're going through those things today, get your eyes back on Him. Get your life centered back on Jesus. And He will walk with you through that. He will help you through that. He will encourage you and strengthen you through that. Verse 38 and 39. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, that's everything we know, will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. In fact, verse 38 is everything we don't know, really, or don't fully understand. The things that are unseen... And then verse 39 are the things we can see, created things. See, the things of this world and all spirit beings that are unseen by this world are powerless because God loves us. He loves us. He loves you. He loves you and he has it all under control. Knows exactly where he wants to take you. All we have to do is cooperate. Receive his love. Live in his love and share his love a little bit. Because nothing can separate us from God's love. Not our sin, not our apathy, not sickness or health, not poverty or riches, not any person or being can keep God from loving us. I want you to say something with me. And I don't do this type of thing very often, but I'm going to do it today. Just listen to me say it, and then I want you to say it with me. I am eternally loved by God. You're a Christ. We say it to me. I am eternally loved by God. Doesn't that feel good to say? That's an affirmation. So be encouraged, church. And just keep swimming. Swim in his love. What helps keep us faithful and hopeful is knowing we are heading somewhere. I remember when I was a kid. I'm doing a lot of personal examples today. I realize that. And I don't always do that. But. Um, as a kid, I was 15, and some of you have heard me tell this story, and I, I won a trip to Disney on a radio station that seven years later I actually worked for. <laughs> How funny is that? God has an irony in that, I know, somewhere. But, um, and a few weeks before we left, I was playing basketball with a neighbor, and I broke my foot. I rolled, I stepped down on the guy's foot, and rolled it right off, and I popped the bone right in the side of my foot. I knew it immediately. It was such excruciating pain. I couldn't walk on it. I had to hop on one leg all the way home because my friend would not help me. It was just two doors down. He, he, was, he was freaked, and he didn't know what to do about it. And so I just was like this all the way home. You know. We went on that trip, and, of course, I was asthmatic, and I was on a lot of medication for my asthma. 
a lot of medication that depended on my ability to run and play and work some of that off, that if it built up, the levels could really put a hurting on me. You know what I'm talking about. And so um, we got about down to Savannah, Georgia, and I couldn't take it anymore. I mean, I was hurting. I was in bad shape, so sick, hurting so bad. Uh, they actually had to stop and take me to the emergency room. Um, they were able to then say, you need to lower your dosage of medicine, just watch your activity level, be careful about your asthma, but you're going to have to lower your intake of this medicine because it was called theophylline. Your theophylline level is way too high, and your body is not able to cleanse it out of you fast enough so that you feel okay. And so that whole trip was very difficult to get to the destination now when I got to Disney I felt better by the time I got there and I had the joy I could they, they put me in a wheelchair and they wheel, I went to the front of the line for everything <laughs> everything in fact I went ironically enough on that little submarine they had with for the Nemo trip but not that Nemo it was a different Nemo 20,000 leagues under the sea but it was still Nemo see how I connected that all back around right my point is this it was a trip to a place that I knew I was going to enjoy, but I had difficulty and struggle getting there. And it hurt. It was really painful. It was sickening. Because life is a difficult journey as a whole. Our own flesh and our own choices add to our difficulties as well. But for those in Christ, we can count on the promises of God. We know the best is yet to come. We know He is always with us and His force, not against us. We know He loves us. All of that is proven through the death and resurrection of Christ and given to us in His Word. So whatever you're going through today, whether it's a crisis or a problem of your own making, of somebody else's making, or just a difficulty in life, or a life happening in your, something happening in your life that you're having trouble dealing with, be encouraged that you are not alone. Be encouraged and realize you can't change what has happened. And you can't control what's going to happen. But you can just keep swimming. Will you do that? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today. God, thank you for the times in my life where you've shown me to just kind of live in the moment. And God, I don't always do a good job of it. God, each one of us in this room sometimes lose sleep over the things that bother us the things that worry us. God, awaken our hearts to realize that we have a choice. We can give control of our lives over to you or we can let those issues of our lives control us. Live in the moment and just look to you and trust in you or we can be consumed by the things that we cannot control entirely up to us that's a choice you give us help us to hold on to your promises to trust in your word and to rest in your love that's where we'll find peace that's where we'll find hope that's where we'll find encouragement for this difficult journey we're on until we make it home thank you Lord for teaching us that today Help us to respond to it by surrendering to you and getting our eyes back on you. Have your way in each and every one of our hearts now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.